So now uh, I'm going to ask Timothy Langeel to open up the next session, which will focus on the Bible through epidemiological lens. Uh, Timothy, please take charge of the session. Will do. And thank you, uh, Professors Efron and um, Wolpe, for your engaging, timely keynote. And uh, this is fascinating for me uh, as someone who teaches uh, Bible at ASU to look at Bible through the epidemiological lens. And so the format of this is I'm going to introduce uh, each speaker before they speak. Each speaker will speak for approximately 20 minutes and we'll save all Q&A for the end. And once again, uh, all questions should be going to the Q&A, not the uh, chat feature here. So our first speaker is Tim, Yitzhak Feder. Tim, Tim, this is Lisa. I just want to jump in before we yep. start. All of, the, um, all of the presenters can turn off their cameras if they want um, during, except for the presenter who is presenting. Um, that way we don't see your faces. Um, a little note. Thank you. Um, so yes, our first speaker is Yitzhak Feder from uh, Haifa, University of Haifa, Impure or Infectious, A New Look at the Bible. Uh, Dr. Yitzhak Feder is a lecturer at ha University of Haifa. He's the author of Blood Expiation in Hittite and Biblical Ritual, Origins, Context and Meaning. That was published in 2011. His latest book, which sounds awesome, Purity and Pollution in the Hebrew Bible from Embodied Experience to Moral Metaphor, and that is uh, 2022, which examines the psychological foundations of impurity in ancient Israel. His most recent research focuses on biblical notions of taboo and their implications for understanding the relationship between emotion and morality. So I'm going to silence myself and uh, pass the floor off to uh, Dr. Feder here for the next 20 minutes. So thank you very much, Timothy, and thank you, Chava, for the, uh, this invitation to participate in the conference that is embarrassingly central to my uh, areas of interest. Um, so in this paper, I will be drawing on my research over the past decade on the notion of pollution in ancient Israel and its analogs in ancient, traditional, and even modern Western cultures. An important part of this re research has been to argue that the ostensibly religious uh, concept of impurity is in fact grounded in lived experience. In particular, I'll examine how pollution served as a folk theory of infection in ancient Israel and in other cultures. In order to fully draw out these implications, I'm going to begin with a theoretical framework which, uh, which examines different levels of uh, causal inferences. So let's jump right into that. So first I begin with a, a conceptual distinction between non-reflective beliefs and reflective beliefs. And here I mean that non-reflective beliefs um, are, the, are, the, are basically our assumptions when we are, in, when we are acting in this world. Um, so this is just our response to regularities of experience. For example, uh, that objects tend to fall when they, you drop them or we have various embodied schemas. For example, uh, trajectories of motion. For example, uh, uh, pre-verbal infants, uh, when they're put in front of a screen, they, they realize that an object that disappears tends to come out the other side. So this is even without language, they, they already have expectations of how uh, different forces in the world work. Um, we don't under, we don't necessarily understand the causal laws that are expressed in these experiential regularities, and that's going to be an important point for us, it's because this ignorance doesn't impede our competent functioning in this world. And so I'm going to, in a second I'll show a um, a schematic framework of how this basically applies to different levels of belief. Um, but the bottom level, basically, is what I would call nature, uh, building on the work of G.R. Lloyd, which, re which uh, refers uh, simply to regularity of experience. So the natural world, the laws of nature, as we would call them, are basically just the fact that the world tends to be regular. Um, so this is uh, what I modestly call my unified field theory. Um, so we'll begin here looking at the 
tier one, the bottom of this uh, diagram, which is the level of immediate experience. So um, that serves as the basis for tier two, our inference of causal forces. So tier one, the natural world, is the concrete sensible experience, which is the vehicle for understanding the unseen causal forces of tier two. So tier two, uh, this natural world must take into consideration causal forces which are not understood and must be taken as givens. Um, we'll give some examples. For example, I don't understand necessarily, uh, well, now we have a theory of gravity, um, but in the case of disease, there's various theories of how one person infects another. Okay, so to the extent now, to the extent that these are mysterious, the fact that we don't, we don't necessarily understand these causal forces, there's no basis uh, for distinguishing between natural and supernatural forces. So here I'm, uh, I'm particularly referring to, you know, pre-modern cultures, uh, and this takes us to the earliest evidence of contagious diseases, uh, which is uh, at least written evidence, which is uh, from the ancient Near East and the Hebrew Bible. And we'll talk about that in a second. So these causal forces in the tier three uh, level of the scheme, can they, they can re receive explanation from cultural theories, theologies, cosmologies. So basically I wanna emphasize that tier one and tier two basically can be experienced to some degree from even animals aside from humans, uh, but tier three, which is mediated by language is, is, is unique to humans. So here's how this all plays out in the case of uh, causality of disease, uh, specifically infection. So first of all, a person gets sick. Um, that's, uh, you know, that's the experience of sickness. And the person can also, on the level of immediate experience, uh, trace it back to contact with somebody else, perhaps, who was sick. Okay, so all of that uh, is just you know, what you have before your eyes. Um, the, the next level, which is an inference, is what is the mechanism which causes, you know, the transfer of the disease from the initial sick person to, say, my sickness. Um, so they could be, there could be various theories. Uh, our modern theories are obviously, you know, often germ-based. Uh, but in the ancient world or in other traditional cultures, uh, the mechanisms of transmission could be a germ, uh, sorry, demons, or pollution or witchcraft or all kinds of other uh, causes, which we would call metaphysical. So all this is just kind of background for the fact that some people may be surprised though maybe at, uh, in recent years, uh, we've heard more about these uh, early evidences of uh, infectious disease. Uh, but the fact is, that from the beginnings of the written record, uh, people understood the idea of infection. So the idea of infection in itself is not anachronistic in any way. So here I'm, I'm drawing on the earliest written evidence, which comes from the letters of Mari, which is a city, which was a city uh, in northern Syria uh, at the early second millennium BCE. Um, they wrote their texts in Akkadian. And they also experienced uh, a series of epidemics. And here's an excerpt from one of these letters. Uh, the God is striking in the upper district. So I, without delay, took a bypass. Furthermore, my Lord should give orders, my Lord referring to the king, should give orders that the residents of the cities that have been touched not enter cities that are not touched. Uh, this is the Akkadian verb, leptatu lest they touch the whole land, okay? So already we see that they, they had an idea of quarantining, uh, quarantining cities. Uh, and interestingly, the terminology they use of basically spreading this infection, the contact, which is also part of that dynamic of causality, is this uh, uh, language of touching which is, uh, as many of us know, is not unique. It's in fact, uh, not only paralleled by the Hebrew verb naga, which is uh, used for the skin disease that we'll talk about in a minute, sarat, and other forms of uh, plague, um, but it's the uh, semantic equivalent of the word contagion, which comes from a contagio, uh, basically from the language of tanger, which is to touch. So this, uh, and we also have Greek and other analogs to this. So in other words, it's fascinating that in these ancient cultures, and they're not 
uh, necessarily uh, uh, directly influencing one another. They independently come to the same terminology of touch to talk about the phenomenon of uh, contagion or infection. Um, and all of this is too familiar. Um, so here I'm gonna bring a few more letters from Mesopotamia. Um, also from the Mari letters, we have letters from the queen at Shibtum to the king Zimrilim re regarding an a servant infected with plague. No one will approach her bed or chair. Or we have a letter from Zimri Lim to Shibtum regarding a different servant. Now command that no one will drink from a cup that she drinks from, nor sit in the chair in which she sits, nor sleep on a bed in which she sleeps. So here we see that they, they, they had a clear idea of what was going on. Um, now, what's interesting here in terms of the mechanics of infection, uh, we see that they had multiple theories for understanding it. And this we learned from a later text uh, called the Shurpu or the burning incantation, uh, which we have copies of from the early first millennium BCE, which deals with the dangers of making contact with a cursed person. Um, so here we see uh, the curse of talking to a, a cursed man, uh, the curse of eating an accursed man's food, the curse of drinking an accursed man's water, the curse of drinking an accursed man's leftovers. So the thing is, uh, all of these seem like a good idea uh, if you see a person who's suffering from a curse. Um, though today we probably call it uh, from a different terminology than curse. Um, one last thing pertaining to the Mesopotamian diseases, um, the, one of the most salient diseases throughout the world and one of the, you know, one of the diseases that are most uh, frequently associated with infection are skin diseases. So um, the Mesopotamian skin disease, Sakhar uh, Shubu, um, referred to probably several uh, skin diseases, probably including uh, leprosy, Hansen's disease. Um, the person suffering from this disease was banished from the community. May sin, the moon god, cover his body with sakar shubu. May he wander perpetually in the steppe. Okay. Um, the healing of the person with this disease was described in the terms of purity or impurity. So may sin cover his entire body with incurable sakar shubu, that he will not be pure until the end of his days. So we'll see that uh, many of these characteristics appear also in its biblical equivalent called Tsar'at, which uh, uh, happily or unhappily uh, uh, happens to be this week's uh, Torah reading, at least in Israel. Um, so this might give some people something to talk about or maybe something not to talk about. It's kind of one of those uh, Torah portions that stumps most rabbis. Any case, uh, the book of Leviticus has many rules about this disease called sarat, um, which is not, you know, medical, the medical, uh, you know, definition of leprosy, but it has certain aspects uh, in common. I won't go into that right now. Um, now, Le Leviticus focuses more on the implications of this disease for uh, purity and specifically for maintaining the holiness of the, the camp in the wilderness. Um, but aside from this uh, seemingly cultic uh, focus, uh, the, the rules seem to hint that they, there was more to it than just worrying about you know, bringing sacrifices. And the clearest statement of this here is in Leviticus 13, uh, 45 and 46, where it says, as the Per, for the person with a leprous infection, this is just a, defin, uh, a translation of Sarat, his clothes shall be rent, his head shall be left bare, and he shall cover his upper lip. And he shall call out impure, impure. He shall be unclean as long as this disease is on him. Being unclean, uh, he shall dwell apart. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. So it took a good uh, 3,000 years for people to understand this requirement to cover your upper lip. But today, we unfortunately understand this uh, all too well. Uh, OK. Um, now, elsewhere in the Bible, and I'll go through this rather quickly for, for uh, purposes of time, uh, we read in the Book of Kings of four lepers, people with this disease, that are uh, banished from their city who are threatened to starve to death. 
And there's no indication this has anything to do with cultic concerns. It seems like people were afraid to be living in the same place as the people with this disease. Um, we also read that King David, when he cursed his, uh, his general jo Joab uh, for the, the killing of, of Nair, he, he curses him, may there never cease to be in the house of Joab a gonorrheic, a zav, a leper, a matzora, a holder of the spindle, which apparently refers to an effeminate male, a victim of the sword or a person lacking bread. So these are all different types of outcasts. And among them are two categories of people who are, according to Leviticus, impure people. So here, gonorrhea and leprosy are divine punishments that lead to social ostracism. In Leviticus, these are depicted as sources of pollution. Now this you know, dynamic, or is this a sickness or a cause of pollution has caused quite a bit of confusion among modern scholars. So the great uh, scholar of Leviticus, uh, Jacob Milgram uh, of blessed memory, he writes in chapters 13 to 14, the verbal statistics understand, uh, underscore this point. Taher, to be pure, occurs, 30, occurs 36 times. Tameh, be impure 30 times. And Nirpa, only four times. Nothing could be clearer. We are dealing with ritual, not medicine. Um, so he's emphatic that this is a symbolic disease. Um, even more surprising perhaps is the great scholar of ancient uh, medicine, Mirko Germick, who writes, to a mind not biased in favor of a purely medical interpretation for any ancient uh, account of a pathological state, one thing is clear. Sarat, the mark of divine wrath, is not a medical notion, but a ritual one. It can be and is applied in the Bible, not only to a person, but also to a clothing or a house. Uh, to be sure, Leviticus is not a medical handbook. The expulsion of impure pe persons is a matter of taboos, not infections in the medical sense. But immediately backtracks, it says, still medicine itself existed only in the shadow of ritual and without distinction from it. It is hard to believe that such a radical social rejection of a person infected with a certain disease is simply the result of mistaken religious ideas of completely benign symptoms. So even he had a problem uh, understanding how they could be, you know, ostracize this person without there being a medical reason. So this has caused a lot of confusion. In any case, I came to my own uh, basically conclusions that impurity is a folk theory of disease was already uh, raised uh, by a medical anthropologist named Edward Green in 1999 in his book, Indigenous Theories of Contagious Disease. And he writes, pollution is not so mystical when examined closely. I'll jump to the red uh, font down there. They involve an impersonal process of illness through contact or exposure. Polluted individuals are not singled out for illness or misfortune by a human or superhuman force. They typically become polluted uh, from mere contact, from being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And he was writing in the context of Southwestern Africa. Um, but his point here was that basically ideas of impurity actually can, are uh, feasible uh, medical notions. Uh, here, I'll quickly mention uh, talk about the Levitical laws of gonorrhea. Uh, basically, a person with an abnormal genital flow um, which was actually translated in the Greek Septuagint as gonorrhea. Um, so what does it say? One with a discharge becomes pure of his discharge. He shall count off seven days for his cleansing, wash his, wash his clothes, and bathe his body in fresh water. Then he shall be pure. Just note, by the way, that the word pure actually appears here in two different senses. The first is the healing of the disease, and the second is actually the finishing off of the ritual process of being pure. Um, on the eighth day, he shall take two turtle doves, five ends, okay. So um, he shall bring two turtle doves and two pigeons and come before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting and give them to the priests. So one could be excused for thinking this is all ritual. And in fact, uh, the scholar uh, Dorothea Urbeli Kuster writes in her book, uh, Body, Gender, and Purity, that the use of the same verb makes clear that the Hebrew text operates with physiological cat categories that are incompatible with modern uh, medical concepts. But uh, if we're a little bit, you know, if we don't expect there to be modern medical concepts, uh, we actually are, find these uh, requirements to be rather uh, consistent with modern uh, observations. In fact, uh, if 
for research purposes, one stumbles upon uh, the CDC fact sheet uh, on gonorrhea, and they read the, the questions, the facts. I was treated for gonorrhea. When can I have sex again? In fact, it says you should wait seven days after finishing all medications before having sex, which is essentially what it says in Leviticus that the person after being healed of their symptoms has to wait seven days. And I, I tend to assume that CDC did not base itself on the book of Leviticus. At least I hope not. Um, so just to uh, summarize these points, the infectious, infectiousness of certain diseases was recognized in the ancient world, despite their lack of a single account of its transmission. Um, accordingly, the terminology was fluid involving multiple etiologies for disease, curse, witchcraft, demons, and pollution. Um, I'll skip that quote. Now, this is basically the same uh, chart we saw before, just mapped onto the, uh, basically with the idea of disease mapped onto it. So we have the direct experience of disease. We have multiple proximate causes, uh, curses, demons, sin, pollution, witchcraft, and ghosts. And above all these in the schemal, uh, you know, hierarchy uh, in the causal hierarchy uh, is the realm of gods, who basically can uh, control everything. Um, and I'll just add here that ritual, it tends to uh, address the uh, level of proximate causes, trying to get rid of pollution, trying to get rid of the curses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'll now just come to my conclusions. Uh, there, this has certain implications for the relationship between science and religion. Uh, con the common tendency to distinguish between religious beliefs and scientific theories implies that religion is irrational. Um, so this would challenge that idea against this tendency to see a contradiction between natural and supernatural explanations in, in people, you know, even Western cultures, they tend to exist together in minds and they're learned together. Moreover, a sharp natural supernatural distinction is inappropriate for cultures which explain empirical phenomena in terms of metaphysical causes. Finally, and then cause of infectious, in the case of infectious disease, supernatural explanations are remarkably down to earth and they in fact lead to behaviors that are uh, used to control their spread, which are all too familiar to us. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fetter, and that was uh, perfectly timed. Thank you. Um, our second, and just once again, uh, we're going to hold all questions uh, to the end after every all our panelists speak, and uh, please put your questions in the Q&A. Our second speaker is Dr. Michael uh, Kosoy, uh, speaking on the 10 Egyptian plagues as a powerful metaphor for the emergence of epidemics. Uh, Dr. Kosoy is a research biologist and transdisciplinary scientist for 25 years, 1994 to 2019. He worked at the National Center for Emerging and Zoonic Infectious Diseases of the CDC. He was a laboratory chief in the CDC's Division of Vector-Borne Diseases in Fort Collins, Colorado. Currently, he's the director of the Kabbalistic Biology and One Health, LLC. He received a master, master of Science in Biology from Odessa University, Ukraine, and a doctoral in Epidemiology from Gamalea Institute of Epidemiology and Microbiology, the author of over 180 pu publications in Ecology, Evolution, Zoology, Microbiology, Epidemiology, Infectious Diseases, and Integrative Science. Uh, he was a principal investigator for numerous research projects in 18 countries of the Americas, Asia, Africa, and Europe. And I will turn it the floor or the screen over to uh, Dr. Kosoy. Thank you too much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. You can imagine that working in the area of biology of infectious disease, I might have a little different view on epidemics. Uh, for many years, I uh, investigated plague in different parts of the world. And also when um, I meet the word translated as plague in across the Bible and uh, particularly in the 10 plague story, I may have different perception. Uh, I fully realize that uh, the Egyptian plagues may not represent the disease that we call plague now. Uh, I have to say, I do see some points to explain plague rather than other diseases in Egypt during the described historic period, 
Uh, for example, the law of Egypt is a plague endemic territory, the first plague pandemic like we started in Egypt. But it would be just a guessing. Uh, I cannot say prove that specific pathogen caused the epidemic at that time. Here, I don't want to take guesses. Instead, I wish to share with you clear and concrete messages that I, as a plague researcher, have reading those Torah portions. The germ theories completely change our understanding what plague is. When we study plague, microbiologists, uh, culture, uh, bacteria, senior pastes investigate the properties. Um, epidemiologists uh, register and analyze cases of disease. Uh, ecolog ecologists study survival of the infection in nature. And working for CDC, my laboratory used all those approaches. So having such advanced technologies, why we do need to start story for understanding plague and answering essential uh, questions. The questions are, uh, let me turn here. The questions are when, how, and why do plague epidemics start? Um, let me take just a real situation to explain why it's not trivial questions. Um, for example, we investigated plague activity near Santa Fe, near, uh, New Mexico. Sporadically, we have human cases registered there. But even we don't have uh, human cases, we still can occasionally detect active plague uh, episodic in wild rodents. Uh, so the question is maybe plague starts from animals, but uh, all uh, animal hosts die from plague very quickly. So uh, my colleagues um, generated a lot of hypotheses that plague can uh, started from fleas, from uh, soil, from nest material. I can continue the line of reasoning, but when plague starts, and here we need to turn to the question of time. This is a fundamental question, right? And main, my point, plague epidemic is a process, not a static state. Um, they, uh, in epidemiological practice, they start to um, count number of uh, cases per astronomical period of time, what I call astronomical period, like days, weeks, months, years. But there is another approach through see time a sequential transformation of biological system by other words using biological time. Sergey Main, the Soviet paleontologist, proposed to see time in biology a set of phases of change, variability, development. Particularly important that each stage leaves what he called footprints that can be used for reconstruction. And compare uh, those criteria with description of time in Kabbalah formulated by Milton Bonder, the Brazilian rabbi. Time can only be measured through transformation of the form. Time is a function of purpose. Time is nothing more than direction. So epidemic is a process, not an object like dead bodies. We cannot see, let's say, uh, wind. But we can see we can see manifestations that wind makes, and we can learn about changes in high level of atmospheres that create wind. The same with epidemics. So today I will argue that each plague described in Exodus represent one of the ten specific stages phases, if you wish, which are necessary and sufficient for preparing background for epidemic manifestation. First plague, dam, blood. If you look at this picture, uh, I would say the best description would be the bloody water. This is a river in Siberia. And uh, surely this is not blood, it's bloody fluid that delivers nutrition and now oxygen in organisms of people and animals. They reported that this deep red color was as a result of high iron contact. 
content from uh, water leaking from nearby metallurgic factory. This is a result of ecological catastrophe, environmental disturbance. In Egypt, um, the Nile River is the most important environment. And, um, they call metaphorically speaking, uh, the Nile is the lifeblood of Egypt. One of the significant movement affecting epidemiology in the end of 20th century is concept of emerging infectious disease. The emergence of disease can be attributed to different factors. But I would argue that outlining source of creating the emergence is almost always is dramatic change of environment at a global or regional scale. Uh, and the leading role of ecological catastrophe in emerging infectious disease has been recognized by scientific communities only recently, but it was clearly articulated in Vera Ocean. Torah speaks a central language, not a conventional language. Science can rely on biochemical analysis to confirm, yes, this is a blood, or even conducting blood analysis. This is not a mission of Torah. Torah teaches to see likeness to some essential issues. This stage is essential in developing plague. And importantly, it's really the first stage. I don't have a lot of time to, to talk more about this, but just think that uh, uh, microorganisms could stay in environment for, for a millennia without causing any pathogenic manifestation until a dramatic shuffling of all components of environment provides a ground for completely new ecological and epidemic scenario. Second plague, frogs. What role frogs play in plague? Uh, they direct role in this question. Well, so it was proposed, but this is not the point that I wish to discuss here. I would interpret this stage in scientific terms as change of ecological niche. Ecological niche is basically um, everything else that organism relates and uh, connected with, uh, in its environment. During life cycle of organisms, the ecological niche can, can suddenly change. If the niche suddenly expands, it creates dramatic risk for spreading of newly emerging pathogens. The visible signs of change of ecological niche can serve as predictors, footprints, as uh, we mentioned before, without identification of specific causative effect. On this uh, picture, um, at that time, many Chinese people sense that the migration of frogs is a bad omen of a coming natural disaster. But the local government calmed people by saying that it was just a natural uh, migration for the purpose of propagation. And a week later, they recorded uh, eight magnitude quake in Xi'an province that killed 10,000 of people, more than 10,000. Third plague, Kenim. The land was hit by infestation of insects. Usually they translate Kenim as lice. It could be also translated as fleas or other small insects. Believe me, it's not easy to distinguish uh, lice and fleas in the field condition for a non-specialist. The main point here is that one of the essential parts of plague is indeed vector transmission. Soon after Alexander Yersin identified the plague bacillus, Yersinia pestis, as a geological agent, they demonstrated that fleas are the most important vector for plague. How to rack at least insects as part of plague system thousands of years before is beyond our comprehension, but it was clearly indicated. It is not a goal of Torah to identify those insects, fleas, or lice, or describe a mechanism of transmission. But existence of plague is indeed supported by transmission of plague bacteria by insect bites. The discovery of flea transmission of plague, along with some other discoveries, led to understanding of importance of vector borne diseases that play an increasing role in infectious pathology around the globe. 
to mention just few examples, Lyme disease transmitted by ticks, trench fever transmitted by lice, West Nile virus transmitted by mosquitoes. Forced plague, a rough. The word a rough generally used to signify a mixture and is interpreted um, as a mixture of wild beasts, some described as a mixture of flies. But what is the importance of mixture of wild animals in plague? In fact, this is very interesting and hot topic that caused recently a lot of discussions. I personally participated in a conference specifically dedicated to the role of biological diversity in emergence of infectious diseases. Just to briefly to explain for developing epidemic situation, a specific level, threshold level of diversity, mixture of various species could be required. For an example, in the US Southwest, uh, where all native rodents quickly die from plague, a certain level of diversity of rodent communities seems is required for continuous transfer of plague from one species to another. Fifth plague, the wear indicates pestilence, episodes among animals. Plague can persist in natural environment analysis for a long period of time. But um, at some point, plague can suddenly manifest in massive die-offs of animals. Plague can cause death of many domestic animals uh, like camels, goats, pigs, but also among many wild uh, uh, animals, six plague. Shaheen, um, boil severe inflammation. This was the first plague that caused the harm to bodies of uh, Egyptians. This plague represents, uh, in my formulation, specific pathogenesis as a result of microbial evolution to invade organisms of people. At this stage, a microbe becomes the pathogen. Yersinia pests is among the most virulent bacteria in the world. As a result of relatively recent evolution uh, from bacteria living in soil, those bacteria acquired some gene products uh, that are associated with virulence. And so-called virulence factors support transmission of bacteria, enhance pathogen survival, spread inside victim body, and uh, determine specific stages at how plague illness develops. Seventh plague, Barat, if we translate it as hail. Barat symbolizes a rapid change of climate. Influence of climate change on emergence of infectious diseases became a very important topic recently. It was a special stress on the role of climate change as driving force for activity and distribution of vector mob diseases. Particularly, so there are a lot of observation on expansion of distribution of some arthropod vectors, such as ticks and mosquitoes following warming trend. And spread of vectors leads to emergence of vector prone disease in new areas. Um, the number of plague cases in people in the United in uh, Southwest, US Southwest, positively correlates with greater than average precipitation. It also depends on te temperature parameters. Eighth, plague eight, Arbech, locust. In uh, Hebrew, Arbech means many. The locust came in great numbers. I would interpret this stage as invasion of alien species. It's another topic in the investigation of ecology and emergence of infectious diseases. It's an invasion of alien species of mammals, birds, insects to new geographical area. Certainly, invasion of locusts is a devastating natural disaster. Another notorious example, um, more related to our topic, is invasion of rats. Rats of genus Ratus originated in Southeast Asia, but with uh, um, human trait. Uh, Ships they distributed to most countries. A little more than 100 years ago, rats arrived to some seaports of the United States in broad with them plague. Another example is West Nile virus that was delivered to the United States by invasive mosquito species. 
nine split Hoshech. The word Hoshech is commonly translated as darkness, but it could also mean misery, destruction, ignorance, sorrow, wickedness. Some commentators describe this word not so much as physical darkness, but more as psychological darkness when everybody looks black. No man could see his brother. The role of wars in developing epidemics is well known. Even during absence of wars, radicalization the device nations can promote devastating effect of epidemics. You can think yourself about some recent examples. And finally, the last 10th plague. Only in this stage, plague is manifested in massive deaths of people that is commonly called epidemic, ignoring, ignoring all previous stages. I read death of firstborn as a fatal outcome of plague among criminologically naive uh, individuals exposed to pathogen first time and therefore susceptible to the infection. During the Black Death pandemic, plague was fatal in 30-50% of infected people. A rate of susceptible individuals is one of the important param parameters that epidemiologists use for prediction a danger of the coming epidemic. And this is my last uh, slide about lessons that we can learn from this story. Plague is a chain of developing stages that leads to massive epidemics. Um, plague, the 10 plague story provides uh, a picture of plague development in total complexity. The story of 10 plagues can help to grasp the nature and meaning of the emergence of epidemics. And uh, plague narrative provided in Exodus are very precise in illustrating the essence of epidemic stages. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kosoy. And our uh, third speaker is uh, Prof Professor Peter Rez from here at Arizona State University. And as you'll see, as uh, Dr. Professor T. Rose Samuelson said at the beginning, um, this conference really embodies uh, transdisciplinary and uh, the range of these papers are Absolutely amazing. So Professor Rez will be talking about, can mathematical modeling guide pandemic response or is the prescription given in Leviticus as good as it gets? And I'm going to quickly introduce uh, Professor Rez, uh, who has a background in the theory of electron scattering as applied to electron microscopy um, and analysis in particular. Uh, Professor Rez has been involved in the uh, development of electron uh, energy loss spectro spectroscopy, uh, EELS, and the technique for not, for not only mapping the composition of materials, but also studying electronic structure and bonding at near uh, atomic resolution. This has led to interest in first principle theories um, of the strength of materials and recent work on uh, lithium ion battery materials and carbon nanotubes. Theoretical modeling of electron and X-ray scattering has led to apply transport theory uh, methods to dose calculations for electron and X-ray radiation treatments of cancer and improved radiation detection. Furthermore, Professor Rez is also interested in nucleation and growth of calcium oxalate kidney stones. He's also been using uh, scanning microscopy and uh, atomic force microscopy to characterize the microstructure of kidney stones. His research, his group has shown that the fundamental crystallites were about 500 to 300 nanometer in size. With all problems in biomineralization, um, the fundamental issues relate to interaction of organic macro um, molecules such as proteins, lipids with the um, mineral surface. He is now applying theoretical molecular modeling method to characterize these interactions. Education background, PhD from Oxford and as a biblical scholar here at ASU, I never thought I'd ever say those all those challenging words in an introduction to a paper on the Bible. And I very much look forward to this. Turn the floor over to you, Professor Rose. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hava, for letting me speak once again at one of your conferences. Uh, I'm going to talk about 
something which actually very similar to what I talked about last year, which is mathematical modeling and the way it is has been used to guide pandemic response. Or as our first speaker Yitzhak Feder said, maybe we should just follow what it says in Vayikra. It's just as good. To, uh, maybe just over two years ago in the developed world, we thought that pandemics, the massive spread of deadly infectious diseases was a thing that happened a long time ago, 1918 and the flu, the Black Plague, or, or maybe it happened in places that are far away like central China or parts of West Africa, to paraphrase uh, Neville Chamberlain, far away places of which we know little. COVID then hit us and changed everything. I don't know, um, do you all remember the, the state of fear, panic, the, the feeling that the authorities were literally running around like chickens with their heads cut off, not knowing what to do? And they turned to uh, the modelers to try and have guides for policy. Uh, how many infections are there going to be? How serious are they going to be? How many hospital beds are we going to need? How many in the ICU, how many ventilators have to be built? How many masks? And also as a guide to what these days are called non-pharmaceutical interventions, which basically boil down to things like masks, social distancing, and isolation. In other words, the interventions that were available in biblical times. Epidemic modeling is actually quite simple. The basic model is called the SIR model. It stands for Susceptible, Infected, Recovered. Recovered actually includes those who died. It just means those who are no longer um, able to get the disease. And it just says that the rate of increase of those that are infected is proportional to the number already infected, uh, the proportion of the population that's already infected times the number that could get infected, the susceptible, with some coefficient in front. That coefficient is generally called beta. And they recover at a rate called gamma. It, for those of you who are following these things, if you remember in those early days how there would be endless predictions on the news about uh, how many are going to, uh, how quickly the infection would spread. They often talked about a parameter called R0. In the SIR model, R0 is just that parameter beta divided by gamma. It's very loosely connected by the, to the number of people an infected person uh, can, can pass the disease on to. It's not exactly the same thing. You can elaborate on this model. They sometimes add a category called exposed, which is an intermediate between susceptible and infected. It allows for the fact that a person can be exposed and asymptomatic. Uh, these sort of models form the basis of the main model used in the United States. It's called the IHME model. Uh, it's developed in Washington University. Another approach is the Bayesian approach. It's appropriate to talk about Bayesian approaches in a conference on religion and science, because the originator of Bayesian analysis, the, uh, the Reverend Thomas Bayes, was in fact an English clergyman. What the Bayesian model says is that it's basically an idea of uh, conditional probability and statistics. It just says that you have a model with parameters. You take an initial distribution, you don't know what they are, you take an initial guess, that's called the prior, you then calculate the probability of some observational data given your model parameters, and map by those together, that gives the probability of your model parameters given the data. Needless to say, this all is very heavily dependent on the assumptions on uh, the probability of the data given the model. This formed the basis of the approach used in England. Um, this is Ferguson's work. Um, and on this basis in the UK, what happened is they radically changed course and uh, went for an extreme lockdown with very drastic measures. Needless to say, Mr. Fer Dr. Ferguson himself did not take any notice of them. Neither did his bosses like Boris Johnson and the cabinet who engaged in, uh, took part in many uh, parties in violation of their own regulations. Uh, paraphrasing Leo, Leona Helmsley, 
Restrictions are just for the little people. Well, do these models work? Well, let's go back a bit. Yeah, you can uh, solve these differential equations and you can get things that look like the course of an epidemic, the susceptible go down, the recovered go up, uh, the infected it has a peak at a certain time and then decreases. But is that what was happening in COVID? Here's the data from the United States. I've tracked both uh, the caseload and the, and the daily deaths, cases per day and the deaths per day. And what you see is there's a number of waves. And um, what's happened is all these models are neglecting a key thing. They're neglecting the fact that the virus evolves. Now, maybe a model that I developed for carcinogenesis with the late Ken Mossman, a distinguished member of this group, might have been of some help here. And we, we tried to publish it, but uh, the, it's, it was too um, out of the ordinary for a journal to accept. So it's one of my great unpublished works. And the interesting thing, you see multiple waves here. Another interesting thing you're seeing is how the probability of death, the deaths compared to the uh, uh, cases, is very much greater in that first wave and then declines. And in that last wave, the Omicron wave, it, it's got much, much lower. This distinction, this separation into different waves is much clearer in the data from India. Here, we're, here you see the alpha wave, here's the delta, and here's Omicron. If you remember early on, the press, the, especially the quality press, were clamoring for more and more rigid restrictions. And Sweden took a different approach under their epidemiologist, Dr. Anders Tegnell. He thought correctly that we were in this for the long haul. And so his philosophy was that what you do, I mean, the data was already there from China, is you protect the vulnerable, the elderly, the immunocompromised. You do that as best you can, but you let the rest of the population get on with their lives. And everybody criticized him and said how irresponsible he was, how this was condemning many to their deaths. So what we should do is compare Sweden to Denmark, two Scandinavian countries, remembering, of course, that the population of Sweden is twice that of Denmark. So we should double those Denmark numbers. And yes, it is certainly true that more died in that first wave because of that looser policy than um, uh, in Denmark, even proportionally. In the subsequent waves, there was really no difference. In that sense, he was right. We were in this from the long term, and these strict lockdown um, restrictions, like in China, they were welding shut apartment doors. In Spain, children were not let out of, a, of rooms in apartments for two months on end. I mean, did they really have that much benefit? You know, the problem with modeling is it really all depends on these parameters. Give me, show me arrows here with the red arrows here and we really have no clue what they are there's a letter sent to the physics magazine physics today february 2022 this is from another theoretical physicist he said what i've quickly found out is that simulation results depend entirely on the input parameters none of which are known with any accuracy and those parameters are almost randomly time dependent So what about plagues in biblical times? We've heard about this from Yitzhak Feder. Well, if you read Torah, you'll find there's a lot of talk about plagues. Ironically, I don't think the, the plagues in Egypt are actually talked about as plagues. Um, but, um, and so plagues, or the spread of infectious diseases was endemic. So was what we call zoonotic transfer, the transfer of uh, viral agents or bacterial agents from animals to the human population, which is believed how COVID started. It was believed to start in bats and then pass through exotic animals like pangolin, and, and then through these wet markets like the one in Wuhan to the human population. And if you can see that people in biblical times lived in close proximity to a lot of animals. Animals were their source of wealth. Uh, 
you know, there's a section in Bimidbar where the princes and the Siim would uh, give these uh, sacrifice, these offerings, you know, uh, so many goats, so many uh, cattle or whatever. My brother always jokes that these days it would be a Gulfstream G650 and six Tesla S's and those who have whose means did not suffice, it would be not a turtle dove but an iPhone 5. Yitzchak Fed always also has already pointed out this passage in Vayikra, Leviticus, uh, Parshat Tazriya. Val sufam yatev, a tametame yikra, koyeme asher hanegabo, yutametame hu badad yashev nechutz lamachene mochshavo, which loosely translated means wear a mask, at least over the mouth, announce to everybody you're infected. I mean, we've uh, Dr. Fed has already talked about how unclean and infected can mean the same thing and isolate. Is that that different from what we do in these days with non-pharmaceutical interventions? The key thing is to minimize contact. In other words, minimize the value of beta. So what's missing in modern non-pharmaceutical interventions? It's number two, announcing infected. When the disease struck and then there were possibilities of going back to the classroom, I was told that I was not even allowed to know if any of the students in my class had the disease or who they were. I mean, this is nonsense. This is a real emergency. One million Americans have died from this disease. That's more than all Americans killed in all the wars in history. So let's forget about things like HIPAA. We treat it as an emergency. This is a principle of Pekua Nefesh, how any laws, the elaborate laws of Torah and Talmud can be abrogated um, to save life. It's very similar in aviation. You know, you're, you're allowed to break any of the federal aviation regulations to meet the extent of an emergency. I mean, in, and really you should take notice of it. There's that tragic case of Swiss Air 111, where they had a fire on board from the entertainment system. And they were within gliding range, almost in gliding range of the longest runway on the East Coast. Yet they spent their time in a holding pattern to try and get their, uh, to dump fuel to get below the official landing weight. They all died. They, uh, I mean, recently I took a trip to Germany and I come back and there's the TSA, there are the crowds and these security points. Uh, and then the groping. And I did a calculation. I'm a theoretical physicist. I calculated I was a billion times more likely to die from COVID at my age than from a terrorist in an airplane. So let's treat it as an emergency. So what did work? A lot of us are alive today because of uh, the mRNA vaccines. Right at the beginning of the pandemic, a, um, a paper was published in Science. The first author was a graduate student, Daniel Rapp. It's in the group of Jason McClellan. And they used a technique that I've been peripherally involved with, cryo-electron microscopy, to solve the structure of the COVID spike protein. But most significantly, they did it. They showed how it bound to the lung receptor, ACE2. And so, what that did is that enabled the immunology people, like Kizzy Corbett and others, to figure out what mRNA sequences were needed um, to use as a vaccine. In fact, the interesting thing in the paper was a bit that most people don't even read. It's the conflicts of interest section, where half the authors said they had a conflict of interest. I later learned that the conflict of interest was that they were advising Moderna on the mRNA sequencing. In fact, it was also used for the Pfizer mRNA vaccine. But you know, the whole story of the development of mRNA vaccines, which has made it possible for us to go back to a semblance of normal life, at every step along the way, the scientific establishment and the funding agencies obstructed the key developments. Uh, Kathleen Carrico came up with the idea and Penn put in numerous NIH proposals to NIH. All of them were rejected. She was denied tenure. She's now chief scientist at Pfizer and Bi Biotech. Um, 
uh, the development of the liposomes, the packaging that was needed. Uh, Jason McClellan wanted to use cryo-electron microscopy to uh, study how uh, mutations in viruses, how, how that would affect their binding, uh, how, how you should use that to develop new vaccines. That proposal got one of the lowest scores in the study section, not funded. I guess we really would have needed that with the uh, um, evolution from alpha through to delta and through to omicron. Five minutes. So going back to the modeling, you know, the modeling, we look at them as like prophets. And so here's a passage from Torah, from um, Devarim, the Pasha Chofetim. Asher nedeber chanavi b'shem Adonai v'lo yiyya chadava v'lo yavochu chadava asher lo yitibru Adonai. B'zadon dibru chanavi lo targu mimenu which loosely translated says, if what the prophet says, because he has a special divine revelation or he has his special expertise in the work of modelers, doesn't actually happen, doesn't come to pass, he's spoken presumptively, justly. I, I could put it stronger than that. And you should not live with him. Well, maybe with the case of uh, scientists who make all sorts of predictions that don't happen, maybe we should just cut off their funding. I look at Torah as what it is, is like the DNA of the Jewish people. We hold those scrolls reverently on in Shabbat services. But like DNA in a living organism, not all of it is expressed. And there's the bit a few weeks ago in the first part of Vayikra, Pasha Vayikra, I mean, do we do those things now? But there are parts of it that are still very relevant to the lives we live today, and I think we should take notice of them. Thank you. So did I get done on time? Oh, you were perfect. Uh, time has been done great here, and thank you for these very rich and diverse uh, papers. The, the range of them is incredible. Uh, so if Anybody in the audience has questions, again, you can put it in the q and uh, I'll just point out that uh, Yitzhak Feder did answer uh, Robert Jouet's question um, about did Greek medical thinking influence biblical concepts of contagion and purity? And Yitzhak responded, regarding most types of impurity in the Bible, I don't see the reason to see a connection with Greek medical thinking. The exception is the laws of birth impurity in Leviticus 12, which seem to operate according to notions similar to Hippocratic ideas. For example, uh, pure blood, which is similar to catharsis as a beneficial purging. I'm not sure that this needs to be explained as dependence on Greek knowledge. 